Praise God. Feel the Holy Ghost in this place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. What a great God we serve. Charlie Brown told Lucy, there's just no hope for our baseball team. And Lucy said, well, Charlie, you lose some and you win some. To which Charlie Brown said, that would be great. (laughs) Oh, sometimes it seems like when we witness, nothing much ever happens. And like Charlie Brown, we think that we are striking out and losing all the time. But the Lord has told us that he would go with us. That's the assurance we have when we share our faith with other people. He said, I'll go with you and I'll be with you until the end of the age. We know that whatever we do for the Lord will not return void. That the seed that we scatter, the testimonies we give to the lost and dying will take root in some of their hearts and they will respond and we will reap a harvest of souls. So keep at it. I like what St. Francis said, preach the gospel at all times and if necessary, sometimes use words. Our lives are the testimony. Well, we've been talking about the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and I want to talk about the purpose of the Holy Ghost today. And um, last week we, we shared with you that the Holy Spirit is something that can be seen and heard according to the Word of God. And in every incident, in every situation, circumstance where it is mentioned, it's something that can be seen and heard. So the Holy Ghost is evidenced by speaking with other tongues as the Spirit of God gives the utterance or the ability to speak. I'd like to draw your attention to Ephesians, the first chapter, and I want to read 12 verses. Oh, well, I'm going to start with verse 3. Um, it says here that all, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. So we praise God For the glorious gift or the glorious grace he has poured out on us. You remember that phrase last week that God poured out the Holy Ghost on people? That he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave us our sins. He has showered us. He has showered His kindness on us along with all wisdom and understanding. What a God. What a Savior. God has now revealed to us His mysteries with regarding Christ, which is to fulfill His own good plan. And this is the plan. At the right time, He will bring everything together under authority of Christ everything in heaven and on earth. Furthermore, because we are united with Christ, we have received an inheritance from God. For He chose us in advance, and He makes everything work out according to His plan. How many know God's in charge? He's still in control. And it says, God's purpose was that we, that we Jews who were the first to trust in Christ would bring praise and glory to God. And now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. Now here, When you believed in Christ, He identified you as His own by giving you the Holy Spirit, 
whom he promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did this so that we would praise and glorify him. Amen. When you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Ghost. Praise God. He gave us the Holy Ghost. There are a number of terms in the Bible that are used to describe the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. Well, in Luke, the 11th chapter, verse 3, Jesus says, the Holy Spirit. Matthew 3.11 calls it the Holy Ghost. And how many know what a ghost is? Ghost is, a, is, a, is the spirit of a departed one. Hebrews 10, verse 29, calls it the spirit of grace. John 14.17 calls it the spirit of truth. Romans 8, verse 2 says, it's the spirit of life. Ephesians 1, 13 calls it the spirit of promise. I just read that to you. Matthew 3, verses 11 and 12 calls it the spirit of burning. 1 Peter, the fourth chapter, verse 14, the spirit of glory. 1 Corinthians 3.16, the Spirit of God. Romans 8.9 calls it the Spirit of Christ. How many know that Christ is, God? <laughs> is the Spirit of God? <laughs> Isaiah, the 11th chapter, verse 2, calls it the Spirit of wisdom and knowledge. 1 John 2, verse 20, calls it unction. That's a term that you don't hear much about, but it's called the unction of the Holy Ghost. John 14 and 16 calls it and describes it as a comforter. And the word there is a paraclete or an advocate. It's someone who comes alongside of you as a lawyer would do to help you in anything that you have need. But I want to point out that in this same chapter, Jesus made this point. And I love the way it's put. He says, not only will the Comforter be in you, it will be with you. Aren't you glad God is not only in us, but He is with us? Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. So all of these terms that I've just shared with you from the Scriptures all describe that one Spirit. There are biblical symbols that describe the Spirit of God. Uh, in Matthew 3.11, it's called fire. In uh, Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13, it's called the oil. <clears throat> in Luke, the 11th chapter, verse 34, it's called wine. John 4.14, 4, it's called water. Matthew 3.16, he's called the dove. Acts 2 and 2 call, calls it the wind. And Ephesians 1.13, as I shared with you, it's called the seal. All of these terms describe the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. People will ask, well, what is the Holy Spirit? Well, I'll tell you what it's not. It's not a third person in a Holy Trinity. It's always puzzled me how somebody can say that they believe in three that make one. You've got God the Father who's old and He has a really long beard. You have God the Son who is the same age as His dad, but He's got a much shorter beard and looks younger. And the Holy Spirit is called a person. Now, someone explain that one to me. The Holy Spirit is called a person. That's incongruent. That's not, that doesn't make any sense. 
I will tell you that the Holy Ghost is not some nebulous spirit floating around. So what is the Holy Spirit? What is the Holy Ghost? John 4, 24 says, God is a spirit. And He is holy. And they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. God is not three persons. God is a spirit. And Jesus Christ is the visible manifestation of an invisible God. It's nothing complicated about that. Nothing complicated. Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verse 4, tells us that there is one Spirit. I've had people tell me, well, the Scripture talks about, well, the Spirit of Christ and the Spirit of God are two different things. I don't read that in the Scriptures. There's only one Spirit. So the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ are the self-same Spirit. You see, the term Holy Spirit speaks of a manifestation of God as it moves and works in the hearts and the lives of people. It, it, it describes, the Holy Spirit describes God's way or purpose in moving in, in the hearts and lives of people. So the, 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 very, very pray, the very phrase, Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, is nothing more complicated than the very presence of God moving in your life and mine. It's God Himself. It's the Lord Jesus Christ moving in our hearts. It is the Spirit that is promised to every believer. Not just to some select few. He says this promise is to you and your children and to all that are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. Let me ask, is He still calling people today? So the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit or all any of these other terms that is used in the Scripture all refer to that one and self same Spirit. There are several things that the Spirit of God does in our salvation for us. The Bible says no man can come to the Father except what? The Spirit draw him. Well, what Spirit is that? That's the Holy Spirit. We don't ever wake up one morning and decide, oh, this is a good day to be saved. If we do decide that, it's because the Spirit of God has been working on our hearts and our lives. So let me share with you some things that the ministry or the purpose of the Holy Ghost is in salvation. But I want to point out that Jesus said in John 14, If I do not go away, the Comforter cannot come. I must go away in the flesh so that I can send my presence back to you in your life. Paul makes it clear, we do not know Christ after the flesh anymore. We only know Him through the Spirit. So God's vehicle or God's manifestation to bring about salvation in your life and mine is, we use the term, Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost, Spirit of grace, Spirit of Christ, Spirit of the Father. I mean, you just, you just go down the list of all the names that are used to describe the Spirit of God. Well, let me tell you, the first thing that it does, the first purpose of the Holy Ghost, is that it convicts. John 16, verses 8 through 13, tells us that the Spirit of God, though the Holy Ghost, will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness, and of judgment. In other words, the Spirit of God convicts us of our, of our sin. So, if you're sitting in a service, or you remember sitting in a service, and you started feeling bad about the way you were living, that was conviction. That was the Spirit of God. That wasn't the devil jumping on your hide. It was the Spirit of God wooing you and drawing you and convicting you and me of our sin. It's the first step of salvation. It's the first step in our journey into God. You see, the Spirit of God anoints His Word here today and this testimony. And that Spirit of God quickens it to our hearts because the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit, neither can he know them, for they are what? Foolishness to him. He has no ability. 
except that the Spirit of God drive that point home. So you're in a service just like this. You're sitting there. The preaching of the Word of God goes forth. The Spirit of God is moving in our midst. And you start feeling pretty bad about the life that you are living and the sin in your life. That is the Holy Spirit. That is the Holy Ghost convicting you. Why? Because He loves you. He's wanting to awaken your consciousness to your lost condition. And, um, and He's going to cause you to see that you need Christ. You need something outside of yourself. And no man can come to Him except the Spirit begin to draw Him. So the illustration of a work of the Holy Ghost from beginning to end is manifested in the fact that God, first of all, convicts us of our sin. I was an evangelist for a number of years. I always call them the white knuckle crowd. You know what the white knuckle crowd is? It's when you stand and you give the invitation and they grab the pew in front of them. And they hold on for dear life because the spirit of conviction <laughs> is so strong on them that they, they grip it so hard that their knuckles turn white. Because the Spirit of God is convicting them. And He's wooing them. And He's drawing them. And God wants them to respond. He wants them to come forward. He wants them to take that step of faith. But they're grabbing hold. Now, for many, I was able to go back and get that grip on that pew unloosed. (laughs) And lead them to the Lord. But see, the Spirit of God convicts us. It is He that's working in our heart. And true, genuine repentance is a result of the convicting power of God. You remember on the day of Pentecost, Peter preached this message. At the end of his message, he said, and it's you that have crucified the Lord of glory. But but God has made him both Lord and Christ. And the Bible says, and when they heard this, they were convicted in their hearts. And they said, men and brethren, what shall we do to be saved? And he gave them the message. Repent. Be baptized. Every one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive. Did you hear that? You shall receive the gift of Of the Holy Ghost. Which brings me to my second point. Is that the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit regenerates and redeems us. Jesus said in John 3, 5, except a man be born again. He cannot see the kingdom of God and neither can he enter it. There has to be a spiritual birth from above. And Jesus likened the new birth as a natural birth. He says... You've already been born one time of water and spirit, but you have to be born again from above of water and spirit. Well, what do you mean I've been born one time already of water and spirit? Well, you came out of your mother's womb in water. And then the spirit of life came into you. You were born the first time. He says, just like that, you must be born again of water and spirit. Well, what does it mean there? The the typology is clear. Psalms tells us that the church is our mother. So you come out of the mother in water, baptism. Because it's the church. It's the mother that's commanded to go and baptize people. So when you come up out of that water for the remission of sins, all the sin of your life is gone. And then the Holy Spirit comes into your life and it is evidenced by speaking with other tongues. Let's see, Stephen, where's Stephen? Wave your hand, Stephen, back there. Stephen, yesterday he was at, he, he was at, the, uh, at the men's breakfast, and, and uh, uh, I asked he and uh, uh, Anthony to give a word since they were baptized last week. And Stephen gave, he gave, gave his word for it. He says, I'm free. Amen. Well, that's what happens when you are baptized <laughs> in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You come out of the mother's womb in water, and then the Spirit of God comes into your life. Titus, Paul writing to Titus, refers to the new birth. He says in verse three, uh, chapter 3, verse 5, as the washing of regeneration. 
the washing of regeneration. I know that there are churches today that do not believe that water baptism does anything spiritual for you, but I'm here to tell you that is not consistent with the Word of God. Because the Word of God says it's called a washing away. It's called the washing of regeneration. And that's what what the, the Lord says. Not only are you baptized in Jesus' name, but you are filled with the Holy Ghost, and that's called the washing of regeneration. You are regenerated into a new person, a new life. But then he adds this, and this is for everybody who's ever received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. He also adds, and a renewing of the Holy Ghost. So this is a golden opportunity to not only receive the Holy Ghost for the very first time, but also a golden opportunity to be renewed in the Holy Ghost right here in this service today. Some people ask me, well, is it necessary for everyone to receive the Holy Spirit? Of course it is. It's the promise of the Father. There's no regeneration without it. There's no adoption as a child of God without it. It will never be something that's optional to any believer because he says you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. It can't get any plainer than that. You shall. And it will never, and and, and likewise, a renewing of the Holy Ghost is never an optional thing for the life of the believer. We need the renewing of the Holy Ghost. We need the renewing of God's Spirit. It's like a car, you're driving it, you fill up the tank with gas, but it'll run out. So you need to go back to the station and get refilled. How many know we need to be filled with the Holy Ghost in our lives? He says also that the Holy Ghost also seals us. Now this this term adoption in the Word of God is not the same word that we use today when someone adopts a child into their family. Similar concept, but it's not the same word. You see, when a child was born in ancient times, it was like going down to the courthouse and actually saying, "Uh, this is the birth certificate. This is my child. This is the seal that this is my child. It's not somebody who was strange or foreign, but now this person's been born into my family. And so when we talk about the adoption in the New Testament or the sealing of the Holy Ghost, it's nothing more than God saying, this is the birth certificate, this is the seal that this person, this man, this woman, this teenager, this boy and girl, is my child. They belong to me. They are born in my family. They are part of my family. So when we talk about the seal of, of the Holy Ghost, or that we are sealed with the Spirit of promise. Paul says in Ephesians 4.30, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, or the the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed. In other words, we belong to Christ. We live a different life and a different lifestyle. So we don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit because, you know, in God's family... We do things differently than the rest of the world. When we belong to Jesus Christ, we live different lives. Our value system is what Christ values. It's what He determines. And He teaches us through His Word that this is the family way to live. These are the ideas that this family lives. You know, any of your parents said, I don't care what... Johnny's parents down the street say, this is the way we do it in this house. Anybody ever remember that? When parents were real parents and they controlled their children rather than vice versa? That was free. (laughs) So what does it mean to be sealed? Well, number one, it means ownership. We belong to Christ. Number two, it means approval. We have God's approval upon our obedience to Him and His work. It means security. That now we are secure. 
We don't have to worry whether we are a child of God or not. I am a child of God. Now, the issue is, is am I an obedient one or am I a disobedient one? But I am a child of God. But it means security. I'm safe as long as the Holy Spirit abides and the seal is unbroken in my life. It also describes the finished work of Christ in my life. You know, once you are baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and your sins are forgiven, you don't ever need to be baptized. I'm talking about a valid scriptural water baptism because a lot of people got baptized by the, you know, the parents. They were sprinkled, which I call the dry cleaning method. They were sprinkled or they baptized because somebody else pressured them to do it. I'm talking about a valid baptism that you decided on yourself. I want a covenant with Jesus Christ. I want to belong to him. Then the Spirit of God comes in, and the culmination of all of that is that we fulfill the gospel of Jesus Christ by dying out his death, burial, and resurrection, by dying out to self, by being water baptized in burial with Christ in baptism, and receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost evidenced by speaking with other tongues. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Another purpose of the Holy Ghost, he says, is that you're going to be endued with power. He says, you shall be endued. That word power in Acts 1.8 means dyna, the, the Greek word is dynamos. It's where we get the word dynamite from. And the Lord is saying to you and me that when we receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, it's like dynamite in our lives. It's power. It's power to overcome the enemy. It's power to live the Christian life. It is power to live victoriously through the power of the Holy Ghost. Not cranking up our willpower, but through the power of the Holy Ghost that lives inside of me. That's what Paul meant when he says, walk in the Spirit. You won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. So when we walk in the Spirit, and he says, this is for all men... So He guides us, He leads us, He empowers us. He gives us wisdom and authority to walk in the Lord. Now, why wouldn't anybody want that? Why would once anybody ever tell you that that's optional for your Christian life? That you can take it or leave it. If you want it, you can have it, but it's not necessary. Why isn't the Holy Spirit necessary in our lives? Now, I know that people will describe the, the, the tongues issue, and we, we talked about that last week, that it's evidenced by speaking with other tongues. And let me share something with you that I share, I've shared in the past, but let me just explain why I believe God chose specifically tongues. Now, he could have, he could have poured butter, buttermilk out your left ear if he wanted to do it for a sign, but he didn't choose that. He chose tongues, and I'm going to tell you why I believe He chose songs. It goes all the way back to the Old Testament. You remember the Tower of Babel? And they were all of one language and one accord and one mind. And God said, whatever they put their mind to, they're going to do. But they're going to do it for an evil purpose. They were doing it in disobedience to God. And the Lord said, we're going to go down and we're going to confound their languages. And we know that the Bible says that their languages were confounded But also, that's where you get all the different races. It was something that could be seen and heard. They woke up the next morning, there were different colors, and there were different languages. And that's what happened. Something that could be seen and heard. Fast forward to the day of Pentecost, where they all spoke with different languages. Something that could be seen and heard. And here's why I believe that God chose tongues. Paul said, if I speak with tongues of men and of angels. So the whole family of God and around the world speaks different languages. There's tongues of angels. There's tongues of men. But in the Holy Ghost, we all speak the same language. 
In the presence of Almighty God, it doesn't matter where you come from, what color you are, what language you come from, when we receive the Holy Ghost, it is the sign, it is the evidence that regardless, in heaven and earth, we all speak the same language in the Holy Ghost, and He understands us. I think it is a reminder to each and every one of us that regardless of where we're from, in the family of God, it doesn't matter what language we speak. We all belong to Him in the family and the body of Christ. So I believe it is a reminder of what God wants to do in our hearts and our lives. Well, let me come to a close here. I shared this with you last week. I'm going to share it with you again on how to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. You see, there's a purpose in the work of God. There's a purpose in the Holy Ghost. There's things that God does with His Spirit in our hearts and our lives. All we're talking about is your, the evidence of receiving that Spirit is always, biblically, speaking with other tongues as the Spirit of God gives the utterance. I was sharing with somebody this week. I remember Pastor Carney tell, telling that when he was, he, was, uh, he was kneeling down by uh, Brother and Sister Brown's couch, Janet, and uh, he, was, he was seeking the Holy Ghost. Now, Sister Carney had already received the Holy Ghost, so he wanted it as well. And uh, he, he, he spoke a line that he didn't understand, not out loud, real loud, and he, you know, being the kind of man, you know, being the mechanical engineer person he was, he took out his pen, and in the back of his Bible, he wrote phonetically what he said in that line. He didn't know what it meant. He didn't know what he said. He just wrote it out phonetically, what it sounded like in the back of his Bible. He said one line in tongues. Did he receive the Holy Ghost? Amen. Of course he did. Now, he would tell you that, well, you want to get more fluent in your prayer language, of course. But the evidence is not, you know, climbing the walls and swinging off the chandeliers and biting the ceiling. Evidence is not what kind of an emotion you may or may not feel. Some people are afraid. They're afraid that God's going to do something with them they, they're not sure of, so... I'm going to tell you, you don't have to be afraid. Amen. You don't have to be afraid. Right. Hallelujah. You know, everybody expresses the joy of the Holy Ghost in different ways. I've heard people whisper in tongues. I've heard people shout in tongues. And everything else in between. See, the evidence is speaking with other tongues, not anything else. Some people are fearful that God's going to get a hold of them and shake them like a rag doll. Well, he may or he may not, but I wouldn't worry about that. The most important thing is that you allow the Spirit of God to speak through you right. as the Spirit gives the utterance. Someone asked me, can, can I fast and receive the Holy Ghost? I said, well, it's a good idea to fast because it shows the seriousness that you have. I remember I was in a country church and I heard this young boy said, you know, he wanted the Holy Ghost so bad that he was fasting. And he lived out in the country and one, one, one of the second or third day that he was fasting, his mom was making biscuits and gravy and jelly for breakfast. And he, he was so hungry. He got up out of bed. He ran to the kitchen. He grabbed one of those biscuits. He opened it up and he slapped some butter and jelly on it. Held it in his hand while jelly was running down his arm. Running out in the backyard. Say, God, I want the Holy Ghost! <laughs> I'm going to tell you, if you hunger and thirst after righteousness, you shall be filled with the Holy Ghost. I've known people driving down the highway who received it. I've known people taking a shower receive it. It doesn't matter the position of your body. It matters the position of your heart and your desire to receive the power of God in your life. So, number one, I want you to believe that the Holy Ghost is for you. Believe it. It is for you. 
The promise is to you. It's to everyone. Jesus said, He that believeth on me as the Scripture has said, John 7, 36, Out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spoke he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. You need to believe that the Holy Ghost is for you. Number two, repentance and confession of all sin, known and unknown. Say, God, here I am. I confess my sin. I confess my need of you. I confess your lordship over my life. I confess you as my personal Savior. I confess you right now that I want to follow you. And the Bible says when you repent, you are forgiven. Step three, and then when you're baptized, it's all removed as if it never happened. Step three, ask God for the Holy Ghost. Ask Him. His premise was, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened. And the concept there is you keep on asking until you get it. You keep on seeking until you find. You keep on knocking until it happens. For some people, it happens very, pretty quickly. For other people, it took them a little bit. But it wasn't God's fault. But you keep on until you're in a position where you actually, by faith, say, God, I receive it. And you don't let fear get in the way. And you don't let, you don't let what, what you think may or may not happen to you when you receive it get in the way. Because if you start dictating to God, He's not going to do it. We have to say, God, however, I can, the only thing I can promise you that you will do is that you will speak with other tongues. That's the only thing I can promise you that's going to happen to you. So he says, ask. And he says, therefore, when you, whatsoever things you desire. Anybody here desire the Holy Ghost? Whatsoever things you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Number four. Worship and thanksgiving. Look, when you're seeking the Holy Ghost, don't stand there like this. Because I assure you, not much is going to happen. The Bible tells us in Luke 24, 47, after Jesus ascended up into heaven, they went back to the temple. And the Bible says they were continually in the temple. Hear that word? Continually in the temple, praising and blessing God. And anywhere from the seventh to the tenth day, the Holy Ghost came on them. So I want you to use your voice, your tongue, your lips. I want you to worship the Lord. It's important to worship God. It's important to praise Him. It's important to love Him openly and loudly. Hello. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. So let's praise Him. You're going to thank Him for giving you the Holy Ghost. You're going to praise Him for what He's done. You're going to thank Him for removing your sins from your life. You're going to thank Him for His grace and His mercy and His love and His great power. And you're going to thank Him for the promise of the Holy Ghost. And you're going to bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. And when you do that, there may be a little transition from doing that to tongues that's called stammering lips. I said last week, you know why we keep the water cold? It's automatic stammering lips. <laughs> no, that's not the reason. We got it warm today, Dean, don't worry. <laughs> but if I thought that would help, <laughs> I, would, I would do it in a heartbeat. <laughs> but stammering lips is the transition from your native tongue, your English or whatever, to speaking in tongues. And sometimes the Bible calls that stammering lips. And sometimes that happens. Some, pe some people, they, don't, they just move from their native tongue to other tongues, and some people move from that to stammering lips, then to other tongues. But I want you to know that when that starts to happen to you, don't stop. Your mind's not going to understand what your mouth and your spirit is praying. 
Why? Because God doesn't want you to understand it. He wants you to know that this is the evidence. This is God's evidence that He has come into your life. He has filled you with His power. And the sign of that is speaking with other tongues as the Spirit of God gives the others. There's nobody more, more shy a few weeks ago than Kim here. And two weeks ago, and she can tell you, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I love her to death. She, she, she's, really, she's really, really grown in the Lord, and a, it's just a wonderful thing to see. Praise God. Amen. But you know, even shy people, very reserved people, can receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Even deaf people receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And it's not stammering fingers and other thumbs. It's stammering lips and other tongues. God is no respecter of persons. So here's the thing. thing, The Holy Ghost, when you receive it, is something that can be seen and heard. It's something that you will receive. So as you begin to worship the Lord... And you begin to praise Him and thank Him. All of a sudden, something from deep within. He's going to come and He's going to come up and and you're going to start speaking a language. As the Spirit of God speaks through you. Using your tongue, your voice, your lips, your mouth. But what comes out is of and by the Holy Ghost. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. Praise God. Hallelujah.